Vamos dar início à sessão desta manhã. Eu vou só uh, dar umas palavras de boas-vindas a todos e passarei depois a palavra à professora Marta Sequeira, que irá apresentar o nosso convidado de hoje, o professor Anthony Widler. Queria só dizer-vos que é um dia histórico para a nossa escola. Uh, não posso esconder este entusiasmo de uh, começar qualquer coisa. Ainda há pouco estávamos a falar na abertura do programa doutoral, mais em privado, só com os professores e com os doutorandos, uh, de um texto do Louis Kahn, que eu gosto particularmente, que se chama I Love Beginnings, e I Do, e portanto uh, esse é o momento dos, do, do iniciar de uma fase nova da escola, seguramente, porque temos mais pessoas e uh, capazes também pensar criticamente aquilo que nós estamos a fazer nos ciclos iniciais e também com a possibilidade nova de trazermos muitas novas pessoas à escola e, como isto vai acontecer agora, abrirmos esse ciclo de aulas e de conferências a toda a gente e não exclusivamente ao programa doutoral. Uh, muito obrigado por estarem aqui, vai ser uma bela manhã e thank you, Anthony, for coming. <risos> e vou passar a palavra à professora Marta Sequeira que irá apresentar o nosso convidado. Obrigado. Muito obrigada, Ricardo. So I'm going to speak in English um, as uh, we have, well, uh, an English speaker uh, as our guest today and as we have many uh, international students also. So I'm very grateful for uh, to all who have come to participate in this uh, historic day for the architecture department of the Autonomous University of Lisbon to all the professors, uh, students, alumni, and uh, so many friends who, for some reason or another, are already part of this wonderful community that comprises the architecture department of WAL. It is with great pleasure that I look at this audience uh, full of interested and interesting people, which together are witnessing the substantial growth of our school Uh, of this, uh, with the opening of this new PhD in contemporary architecture. So, in fact, it is common to say that doctoral theses on living authors should not be done, that about their work, it would be better for them to speak, that from then uh, there is no historical distance. Uh, however, the truth is that many research about the present or about a very recent past as well as in particular about living authors proved to be extremely fruitful. Still, the truth is that the PhD thesis that look to the present day and especially that take into account this possibility of relationship with its main actors are scarce. Although the reflection on contemporary architectural production and the challenges it faces have, has been taking place in the context of curatorial and editorial activity, it has been, in fact, avoided in the academic sphere, traditionally dedicated to the history of architecture and mainly to the past. However, I have had occasionally uh, several signs, both from people who are eager to do their PhDs and from authors of exceptional practices that uh, they all long for a truly intense and interesting relationship between academia and the world of production of contemporary architecture. In fact, this critical relationship seems to be, at the end of the day, absolutely necessary and I can say urgent. And I have no doubt that the architecture department of the Autonomous University of Lisbon is the perfect setting for this to happen. Um, if the degree in architecture at the Autonomous University of Lisbon was born more than two decades ago, and you can pass from the great disappointment with the practice of teaching in the faculty of origin of its founders, Manuel Graça Dias, João Luís Carrilho da Graça, and uh, José Manuel Fernandes. I, I suppose that the two uh, last ones are here with, with us today. Having created a craft school uh, linked to the profession and professionals of architecture, an extension of practice with a surprising field of freedom, a small different school with a great involvement between teachers and students with great proximity, 
The new PhD in architecture at the Autonomous University of Lisbon is precisely designed to overcome the traditional doctoral research in the scientific area of architecture, as well as its underlying withdrawal from the creators who develop research methods based on practice. So this PhD is staffed by professors at the highest level. Uh, as in the integrated master's course of architecture, the academic staff is clearly diverse in its approaches, but absolutely current and in the intensity of the commitment to the discipline. The program has professors such as Arturo Franco, Bárbara Silva, Filipe Ramalhete, Manuel Ares Mateus, Nuno Mateus, Pedro Bahia, Ruth Figueiredo, Ricardo Carvalho, the later that assumes just like me, the coordination, um, not only the professorship, but also the direction of this course. But this program also counts in its first edition that is starting precisely today, now, um, with the participation as guest speakers of Anthony Widler and Tom Avermaet, who come directly from Cooper Union in New York and ETH in Zurich to be face to face with our students as well as with Eduardo Sotomor and João Luís Carrilha Graça, two of the most important, important Portuguese architects of the moment, reiterating a true communion at the highest level between two worlds, that of academia and that of architectural production. And it is also set with the most fantastic students, Andrea Salazar, which is today with us by Zoom, um, from Ecuador with a solid academic and editorial cu culture immediately captivated us with her energy and enormous commitment. Luis Junior from Brazil with an interesting academic background. Pedro Reis, an exceptional and widely awarded architect, a professor of our school, uh, will certainly be an excellent testimony on, of how a professional practice at the highest level can be combined with completion of a doctoral thesis in contemporary architecture. Miguel Judas, uh, with his diversified experience and sharp critical spirit, will undoubtedly be a fundamental piece of this puzzle. And it will be a great honor to welcome back now as doctoral students, four of the most brilliant students who graduated in this school. Uh, Rita Aguiar Rodrigues, Raquel Vicente, Rodrigo Lino Gaspar, and Pedro Pedro. Uh, these were the doctoral students who choose this school to carry out their PhD and that we choose to carry out this adventure with us. For them, I ask for a round of applause. <laughs> So it now remains for me to finally introduce Anthony Widler, to whom we are very grateful for having come expressly from New York to open the new doctoral course at the Autonomous University of Lisbon, and who immediately showed all his support and enthusiasm for this PhD in contemporary architecture. His excitement was such that he has even shown himself to be available to guide uh, some of our PhD students in the future. So uh, the relationship between this course and Anthony Widler has a promising future. Many thanks, Anthony. Anthony Widler needs no introduction, introduction for many who are here today, but because there are also many students from the early years of the architecture course, I can only say that he's one of the greatest architectural historians of the 20th and the 21st centuries and undoubtedly one of the key figures in the history of architecture, having always been at the center of world architectural reflection, as you can see through this image. In fact, in this image, we can also see someone that is also here in the audience, Stuart Red, um, a visual artist and landscape designer that has uh, been a curator at the moment in New York. In New York. Well, but uh, Anthony Widler obtained his degree in architecture at Cambridge and uh, his PhD as at TU Delft, member of the Princeton University School of Architecture faculty from 1965 till 1993. In 1993, he was appointed professor and chair of the Department of Art History at UCLA with a joint appointment of, in the School of Architecture. 
And from 2001 to 2013, he served as Dean of the Irving Chain School of Architecture, the Cooper Union, where he currently remains as a professor. A uh, historian and uh, critic of modern um, and contemporary architecture, specializing in European architecture from the Enlightenment to the present, he has curated several permanent and temporary exhibitions, including the permanent exhibition of the work of Claude Nicolas Ledoux in the Royal Salt Works, um, and the notes from the archive, James Fraser Sterling uh, in the Yale Center for British Art, and an exhibition that then traveled to the Tate Britain and Stats Gallery, Stuttgart in 2011 and at the CCI in 2012. She, Widler has also published a huge number of books, including The Writing of the Walls, Architectural Theory in the Late Enlightenment, um, Claude Nicolas Ledoux, Architecture and Social Reform uh, at the End of the Ancient Regime, uh, The Architectural Uncanny, Essays in the Modern uh, Anomaly, Rapid Space, Architecture and Anxiety in Modern Culture, Histories of the Immediate Pre Present, The Invention of Architectural Modernism, James Fraser Sterling, Notes from the Archive, the Scenes of the Street and other essays, and more recent publications include Claude Nicolas Ledoux, uh, and I've heard that he's now working on a book of essays on post-war architecture. Uh, but Anthony Widler has been, above all, an inspiration for young researchers who find in his enormous curiosity, intelligence, and per perspicacy a source of inexhaustible breath. As he explained me in his lecture today, he will question the orthodoxy of the periodization of history advocated by Western art historians of the late 18th century and in complete harmony with our doctoral program. I suppose he will claim precisely history as an active participant in the ethics and sensible practice of contemporary architecture uh, design. So I conclude with an excerpt from the poem Letter to Leon Felipe by Octavio Paz, written in 1962 as one of the many tributes to poets and artists coeval to the writer who, although erratically removed from its context, could serve to differentiate the PhD thesis which will come out within the scope of this new PhD in architecture at the Autonomous University of Lisbon from the others, namely the PhDs by design, but also the PhDs in history of architecture. Some want to change the world and others want uh, to read it. We want to talk to it. And I'm sure that Anthony Widler will help us on talking to it. Many thanks, Tony, for coming. Well, uh, Marta, after that, what can I say? Um, it seems that you've said an, everything and uh, told a very good story uh, about me. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more uh, about me later in this lecture, uh, but I would like to alter this, uh, the, the quote that we had just then, which was, uh, uh, we want to talk to it. After we've talked to it, we want to change it too. So. <laughs> Uh, I think it's very important that uh, we think of ourselves not as passive uh, uh, observers of the past, uh, but as uh, active uh, interrogators of the past in relationship to the present and the future. And I'm here as an architect, as a critic, as a theorist and a historian, uh, but speaking fundamentally out of my architectural uh, desire uh, to make an architecture for the world as it exists and for the world which, it, which will exist and to make it better. So let me go to my text for a little while and then I'll, I'll, I'll leave the text uh, uh, a, a little bit later in the talk. I can actually move, it works. So the Anthropocene. Um, to start with, it's a great pleasure that I return to Lisbon, one of the three cities I like best in the world. 
which places Lisbon with Paris and Porto. And maybe Venice, but without the tourists. <laughs> Is the war pleasant that I return to see so many friendly faces from former visits? But today I'm especially honored to be invited by professors Ricardo Cavallo and Marta Sierra for the initiation of this new doctoral program. As you know, I've been involved in the teaching and development of doctoral programs in architecture since the beginning of my professional and scholarly work in architecture. And I've always sought to find ways of connecting historical and theoretical scholarship with present conditions of design and practice. As a trained architect, historian, and critic, I see the past of architecture and urbanism as a consistent lesson for the understanding of the present. Like Le Corbusier, as he stated in his letter to his teacher, I am consistently aware, quote, that the ancestors can speak with whomever wishes to consult with them. This quotation is at the center of Professor Sequeira's extraordinary work on Le Corbusier's precedence for his design of public space. And there she comments. This is, this is where we are. And that's what I have to say about the Anthropocene. We're here, we've been in it a long time, and we have to face it. Le Corbusier, the ancestors will speak to us if we wish. Uh, Marta Sakira. The construction of a public space, one that is the representation and glorification of the collective, is a transversal condition in the history of mankind. It is the demonstration of human beings' inherent need to build the center of public life for the community to which the people belong, as well as the need to confer an identity on its urban space. It is a very pertinent topic in our time. Whenever one attempts to establish an idea of public space, that is adjusted to present society and whenever one faces the difficulties that it implies. By studying the exemplary public places designed by one of the great masters of modern times, and there, of course, she's talking about Le Corbusier, what clearly comes to the fore is the valuable mechanism used to, to address the issue of creating a public space that represents the values of a contemporary collective. The study of the great models of public spaces uh, from the past. I believe that such a sentiment taken from her great book on towards public space on Le Corbusier might well be the motto of this present foundation of a research program in contemporary architecture. So in this talk, I'm going to introduce three questions I think would be important to think about as you students and faculty together begin work on this new enterprise. And I want to, I want to emphasize that um, coming to this school, the small autonomous school of architecture founded in the way it was, um, I feel very comfortable. Uh, when I was invited to uh, join uh, the faculty as Dean of the Cooper Union, uh, it's probably the only invitation uh, for a major administrative position that I would have accepted. And I accepted it because it was a small school. It was a community of equals, faculty and students, researching and working together over five and now over six and seven years with its master's program, uh, together uh, in a small space uh, in relative poverty in terms of very little endowment, uh, but absolutely committed uh, to the idea of an architecture that can serve the public, uh, the public realm. Uh, and I feel at home here. Uh, because of the kind of community uh, that has been described to me. And so in speaking here about the PhD program, I'm, ex I'm speaking here really uh, to the entire community of students, undergraduate and graduate here, who are serving uh, the research of architecture, who are making research of architecture from the very first drawing uh, that they do in the first studio uh, that they enter. So it's a collective undertaking, this research in architecture. And even though I'm talking about PhD programs, I'm really talking about uh, the work of an entire school. So in this talk, I'm going to introduce three questions I think would be important to think about as you, students and faculty together, begin to work on this new enterprise. The first would be to critically assess the present state of architectural history, its criteria, resources, and the limits placed on it 
by present and past academic protocols and disciplinary specializations. The second will be to look at person, but previous and existing programs as they've tried and still try to work in the contemporary context. The third might be to explore emerging ways in which the contemporary might be researched through archives, of course, but also through the development of media presentations, the curating of exhibitions, the active engagement of architects into the, into the research of their own practices, approaches, and design methods. I will take these three questions in order and approach them in the context of my own experience. One, the criticism of past architectural scholarship, two, the development of PhD programs, and three, my own research in archives and the curation of exhibitions. In the general sense then, what I wish to consider this morning is a question that's haunted doctoral studies since their inception. What is the value, influence, and the nature of historical and theoretical studies in architecture? Or more bluntly, what is the role of history and theory in the research, teaching, and development of design? We've, since the 1960s, we've passed through a series of phases and engaged in endless debates on this question. We've heard the arguments for autonomy or quasi-autonomy of the design disciplines, as well as those for its need for history and theory. We have seen the expansion of historical studies in the schools of architecture and the proliferation of PhD programs. And beyond this, the expansion of interests in these programs in topics and research that have not always seemed entirely architectural. Equally, we've seen the development of quasi-autonomous courses and studies in which is called theory and the expansion of these into topics that seem more naturally to fall into philosophy and social science rather than into architecture. So now I turn uh, to history. History, of course, or in earlier times, memory or storytelling has haunted architecture as a discipline since antiquity. We remember Vitruvius's problems in delineating the boundaries of architecture as a scienza, surrounded by other forms of knowledge, law, philosophy, music, medicine, astrology, clock making, and history all those areas of knowledge that the architect needed to understand without necessarily becoming a specialist in them. For Vitruvius, history, or as he called it, historia, meant, meant the art of storytelling. Nothing like history is to us or was quite recently today. The anecdotal recounting of the mythical origin of the of the orders or the Persian Caryatids, the discovery of the acanthus plant growing in a basket in Corinth, for example. For Vitruvius, storia was important that the architect could in fact uh, develop a reason for all the decorative uh, motifs uh, that the architect was about to place uh, on simple architecture. Uh, this is the document uh, as it was reproduced uh, for the first time with illustrations in the uh, early Middle Ages of Vitruvius. Even Alberti with the Renaissance, Storia was more simply a mark of ancientness, of ancient patrimony, than any real method of distinction between, say, medieval and classical. For him, and the example is here, the medieval baptistry and Duomo of Florence were equal in beauty to the Roman remains himself, themselves, and he even uh, introduced motifs from the baptistry of Florence from the medieval period uh, into his uh, work at Santa Maria Novella. So there was a complete uh, confusion between ancientness and history as we know it now. History as we know it now came into play uh, early in the 18th century uh, with Fischer von Erlach's uh, uh, discovery of a kind of sketch of world history. But even then he is concerned to introduce the history of history of architecture, including uh, that uh, extraordinary story told to us uh, by Vitruvius uh, about the way in which uh, uh, the architect Dinocrates uh, talked to the, uh, uh, to the uh, 
to the uh, king of the Persians, uh, saying that he could make a big uh, 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 city uh, for him uh, by sculpting his, uh, his uh, figure into uh, Mount Athos uh, and uh, causing water uh, to uh, run uh, from his arms. So within the early part of the 18th century, history is still mixed with myth, with stories, with anecdotes, uh, and uh, a whole range of, uh, of unclassified uh, elements uh, of architecture. History as we know it came into play with the mania for classification of Diderot's encyclopedia in the 1750s in the Enlightenment, and with its architectural contributor, Jacques-Francois Blondel, who founded the first public school of architecture uh, as a training ground for architects and the newly established uh, Corps of Engineers uh, in 1750. Uh, Blondel's School of the Arts from 1749 to 62 provided courses and design experience for aspiring architects, engineers, contractors, and even clients, each with their own level of destruction instruction. But the radical move was the dividing up of a discipline still largely based on tradition, precedent, and guild practices into easily swallowed sections of knowledge in the forms of courses, lectures, shop experience, sites visits, and of course, a studio uh, and atelier design problems. Indeed, I looked the other day at his curriculum uh, in the uh, seven volumes of his, uh, of his course of architecture. And I found that if you took the content of the curriculum out, although not all of it, uh, all the different uh, subject matters of the courses could exactly mimic the school of architectures that you have today. Uh, history, theory, technology, mathematics, drawing, site visits, construction, and studio. So it's the first school of architecture to actually divide up the, uh, the problem of architecture into separate sections and therefore uh, begin that, uh, that process of a kind of disintegration into separate specializations of architecture as a set of disciplines that become more and more difficult to relate to each other in the, uh, in the, uh, in the present. By the 1760s, Blondell's school had been so successful that one of his students uh, was even appointed to the first chair of history at the French Academy of Architecture just before it was destroyed uh, in the French Revolution. And a record number of architecture students, including Ledoux, uh, whose, uh, whose work uh, published just after the revolution reflects the entire thought of, uh, of Diderot and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and the Enlightenment uh, as a whole. Uh, in a very novel uh, and very long treatise, uh, which puts uh, ideal projects and real projects together under the title, which is really even now uh, particularly uh, innovative in, in relationship to architecture, not just Ledoux's architectural products, but architecture considered in relation to art, mores, morals, and legislation, the organization of architecture uh, for society. And of course, uh, Boulet, a uh, colleague of Ledoux uh, in the academy who presented these great drawings uh, for his students to emulate uh, in his own uh, atelier. It was one of Boulet's students, Durand, uh, who uh, at the newly established Ecole Polytechnique in 1795, took this classificatory system of Blondel like those being developed in the natural sciences, Linnaeus, Buffon, and others, to a higher or more systematic level. First, in collecting together all the building types uh, of antiquity and, uh, and the present, uh, and comparing them in plan uh, and uh, style, and then abstracting the elements of architecture into a kind of uh, geometrical code uh, like the code being developed by the head of the Polytechnique, uh, uh, Gaspar Monge, who was uh, uh, an engineer and technologist and who invented uh, not only uh, graph paper, but also the axonometric and also the metric system. And so to, uh, to cohere uh, with this analytical understanding of the Polytechnic School, uh, Gironde organized his architectural courses in, on graph paper 
uh, so that the diagramic, diagramming and reduction into graphic figures, uh, points, lines, and planes of architecture could leave architecture open as a structure uh, to be uh, uh, completely uh, uh, um, open to the uh, different styles uh, of uh, architecture. The history itself uh, was uh, beginning to construct. So by Durand's abstract method, history was entirely divorced from a system of composition so that the underlying process of design allowed for the application of any number of historical styles now being studied in detail in the early 19th century, separated out chronologically, detailed and endowed with specific characteristics, moral and aesthetic. History proper, uh, taught by uh, Catherine de Cancy, the great classicist, uh, and later by Ville le Duc, the great Gothicist, uh, were, was now understood as a series of styles, Gothic, classic, exotic, each, each representative of a period in history or a cultural idea adopted as appropriate for the character of a particular monument. By the end of the 19th century, this catalog of styles became rooted in the academic theory of a new breed of art historians in the university. Art history uh, in the late 19th century uh, under, under Werflin uh, in Berlin and others and Regal in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in Vienna uh, became an academic subject, had to demonstrate its scientific uh, characteristics and began uh, to be understood as a rigorous and scientific study. Following the historical method of Hegel and the evolutionary model of Lamarck, art historians set up what we now know as art history, bringing together painting, sculpture, and architecture, drawing finer and finer distinctions uh, between observed styles, uh, understanding the styles as they moved uh, ge geographically and topographically across the world. Choisy, the ar architect engineer, in his uh, two volume history of architecture uh, 19, uh, in, in 1898, 1899, uh, began to analyze the way in which architecture as a style uh, developed in the medieval period, developed in the classical period uh, from uh, antiquity uh, to the present. And so style was added to style, Renaissance style, Mannerist style, Baroque style, neoclassical style, one can make a whole history of the uh, addition of style to style in art history. By the beginning of the uh, 20th century, uh, architects and artists themselves, eager to find their place in history, or better still in the avant-garde of history, coined styles for themselves. Otto Wagner uh, coined the idea of modern architecture, Marinetti, the architecture of futurism, Le Corbusier, purism, Theo van Dosberg and Mondrian, de style, Art historians, not to be outdone, collected these styles and invented a modern movement. A modern movement, uh, which was, as we know, uh, after World War II, uh, transformed into a postmodern movement followed by a late modern movement. And we have others again and again since. Other architects and critics seeking to stand apart invented their own modernisms. Uh, Smithson's and Rainer Bannum's New Brutalism is a prime example. Uh, and these, uh, this, this mode of looking at history, uh, looking at art history was canonized, if you like, uh, in the mid uh, 20th century uh, by art historians like Nicholas Pesner, uh, who uh, distinguished between, first of all, architecture and all the other stuff uh, that was built in the world uh, because a bicycle shed is just a building. He said, it's a cathedral that's a piece of architecture. And here are two illustrations from his uh, 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 European outline of European architecture showing the great uh, trajectory that he developed in this history uh, from the Parthenon and from, uh, from Greece and Rome all the way through uh, to, to Gropius. Uh, uh, at the Corbusier himself, uh, the added to this notion of an architecture uh, that moved in progressive form from, uh, from, the, from the temple to, uh, to the villa, to the ship, uh, developing the notion uh, against Pevsner that uh, all architecture 
is uh, in design or all design is architecture. Architecture is in the telephone and in the Parthenon and, and, and making that correspondence famously uh, between the, uh, the, old, uh, the old Doric and the new Doric uh, from Pestum to the Parthenon and the old cars. Uh, here, of course, he points out that it's an English car, which is the old uh, uh, car, which is uh, made half uh, horse and carriage and half uh, engine. But of course, it's uh, the French de large grand sport, uh, which, is, uh, which is the perfect example of the prototype of the highest and, and best uh, car. And so we have uh, Nicholas Pevner characterizing the modern movement, uh, the pioneers of the modern movement from William Morris to Walter Gropius, uh, stopping at Malta Gropius, the outline of European architecture, the, the notion of the, of the bicycle shed being just a building and Lincoln Cathedral being a, uh, a, a, a work of architecture. Uh, and then uh, around the same time, there was Henry Russell Hitchcock and Philip Johnson trying to codify modern architecture into a style uh, with the international style uh, book of, uh, of, of 1932. Uh, and uh, here we have Henry Russell, Russell Hitchcock developing his book on modern architecture in the 1920s, uh, seeing it as a progress from, uh, from, uh, from the 18th century uh, to uh, the present. And of course, uh, Gideon's uh, Space, Time and Architecture, uh, where uh, he is seeing architecture as a progressive development of space uh, from the Baroque uh, to uh, uh, his hero, uh, Le Corbusier. So in all these uh, uh, examples, uh, as studied in art history courses, this idea of an architectural history became a mantra, an orthodox, so that st students could and still can do research into postmodern architecture as if it existed, as if it could be defined and constituted as something tangible. Similarly, with a host of more recent studies, of what has been called brutalism. This style frenzy research culminating in Nicholas Pevsner uh, is, I think, something that we as scholars have to completely deconstruct. We have to take off uh, the isms of uh, architecture and to look at architecture for what it was and what it is in the context of its day and try not to fit it in categories of our own making. We have to understand its own life in its own time and its own resonance for our own presence. In fact, I gave a, 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 a seminar uh, at Princeton last, uh, uh, last term uh, where I said, uh, which was the, I think the, the, the cry was away with the isms. And so we took off all the isms of uh, post-war architecture and we tried to, tried to look at the objects uh, that had been called postmodern brutalism, modernist, late modernist, early modernist, uh, uh, or all the other categories that have uh, people like Charles Jenks have tried to fit in uh, architecture into. Uh, and it was extraordinarily rewarding. Uh, we were able to see, uh, and I'll be talking about this a little uh, bit uh, tomorrow night uh, at the Technical University, where I talk about uh, the, the, the way in which uh, an architect like James Sterling was completely constrained by the fact uh, that uh, from the beginning of his career, uh, Rainer Banham called him a brutalist, uh, and even more constrained by the fact that as he emerged with his own way of making architecture during his career, uh, Charles Jenks called him postmodernist. Both of those terms taken off, you can see the inventive nature and the active nature of someone trying to invent a language out of modernity in order to speak uh, to his time uh, without an ism uh, being uh, framed around him. But none of this research reflects what we as architect researchers trained in both design and history might be called the historical and theor theoretical conditions of an architectural object. And it's this kind of research that I think this program is going to be involved in. It is not research, let me put it more simply, to prove or disprove that one or another building by Caesar or Rossi is not or is postmodern or modern or late modern or neo-rational in style. We need to know more. And for this, we have to cast a wider net than the simply visual recognition of style elements, a net that demands and has demanded since the 1960s and more in 
and more urgently, I think, uh, as we begin to understand all the implications of architecture and environment in the particular conditions of, of climate and society that we live in. It demands inclusion of the history of design methods, the history of construction, the history of context, the history of ideology, the history of economics, the history of politics, and more recently, the history of gender, racial exclusion, colonial and post and neo-colonialism, urban and region territorialism, and much more. And we can talk about this uh, later uh, with the PhD group. Here, I'm going to turn to my second theme, that of the development of uh, architectural PhD programs. that took place in the context of an explosion of interest in architectural education in the 1960s. This expansion of what we might call the architectural field took place in almost every area of architectural and urban thought. This was recognized by successive conferences uh, in Britain and in the US and elsewhere and blue ribbon commissions on architectural educations after the war. I note only as examples, the Princeton Conference on Architectural Education of 1953, the Royal Institute of British Architects Conference on Architectural Education of 1959, and more specifically to our theme this evening, the 1964 meeting at Cranbrook on the history, theory, and criticism of architecture. Suddenly the Princeton Conference set the stage for the establishment of a school of architecture at Princeton in 64 uh, that I will begin to talk about in just a moment. First, Cambridge. Professor Sir Leslie Martin came to Cambridge with a sense of urgent need to reinvigorate architectural education on two fronts, intellectual, historical, cultural, critical, and theoretical, and professional in terms of research. Uh, he himself had been head of a school at Hull, but been head of the uh, RIBA Commission on Education and was, was appointed to Cambridge in 1956-57 with the idea that a new school of architecture uh, could be constructed according to the new formulations of the relationship to cultural, historical, critical, and theoretical studies on the one hand, the humanities and social sciences, and professional uh, research in terms of uh, design uh, methods on the other. And he came to Cambridge with a sense of this need uh, he had, was one of the first uh, architects uh, himself to have a major PhD uh, in, uh, in Baroque Spanish architecture, in fact, uh, at the same time uh, as having a, a very strong relationship uh, to modern architecture. He was a convinced modernist. He was a founder of, before the war, the Journal Circle, and did friends with Nam Gabo, Henry Moore, and the British modern modernists. He came to Cambridge then with two apparently compatible, but ultimately incompatible aims to establish architecture and the study of architecture as a humanistic discipline, and at the same time as a design research arm of the profession. To this end, he fabricated a curriculum at once centered on history and theory uh, with the intimate relations between history, theory, and design established by the faculty themselves who moved easily between the two. In other words, there were no uh, art historians uh, teaching at Cambridge. They were only architects teaching their history. Uh, he himself uh, developed the first uh, year of, uh, of the history of theory, followed by Colin St. Jim Wilson. You can see him uh, on the right, uh, who uh, himself uh, had uh, done a very serious study uh, of uh, the modern movement. Uh, the history, the ancient history was also delivered by architects. Uh, Peter Eisenman even gave uh, a course on the Gothic, the history of the Gothic, and of course, Colin Rowe for the Renaissance. And all of them took part in the studios. There, were no, there was no distant, distance at all between the teaching of history and theory and the teaching of design and the understanding of design. And history and theory didn't cripple design, history and theory informed design. Here, the distinctions that Manfreda Tafuri will talk about later, wanted to draw between operative and purely historical criticism 
were completely ignored. Everything was in the service of understanding, interpreting, and designing architecture. So that was the, 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 the first, uh, the first uh, moment. Uh, and the first research group uh, was explored uh, in the institute set up by Leslie Martin. Uh, and uh, this is the, uh, this is the, the, the little uh, extension to the architecture school built by Colin Sundjum Wilson, uh, completely uh, regulated. Uh, one of the few buildings in England, I think, completely regulated by Le Corbusier's Modulor, which had just uh, been, uh, been published. And of course, uh, was uh, hailed uh, by Rainer Bannum as the as the sort of the, the poster child of uh, of, of brutalism, uh, and the uh, second uh, major building of Leslie Martin, uh, Collins and Jim Wilson and Patrick Hodgkinson, uh, the uh, Harvey Court at Cambridge, uh, which established uh, the relationship uh, not only between uh, college architecture and uh, courtyard architecture, not only between uh, low-rise, uh, high-density uh, uh, apartments uh, and, uh, and uh, the development of, of cities, but established a prototype based uh, uh, on uh, uh, Collins and June Wilson's uh, uh, experience of uh, Alto at San Yatsalo. So you have the bringing together of San Yatsalo Alto, uh, a kind of uh, a, a, a courtyard architecture which relates uh, to Cambridge, uh, but with, which became uh, a paradigm uh, for the development of, uh, um, the, I think a very unfortunate paradigm uh, for the development of what was later called the Land Use and Built Form Studies Institute headed uh, by Lionel March. Conceived on the basis of what from the mid sixties had become a new theme in the exploration of architectural history, the theme of typology. I can't go into that uh, this morning, it's a very, uh, developed uh, uh, discourse, uh, both in Italy uh, and, in, uh, and in Europe, uh, in, in Europe uh, in general, uh, in the 1960s, uh, Italy with uh, Rossi and Aymanino, uh, and, uh, and in England with Martin. Martin, together with Collins and Jim Wilson, had already developed the housing prototypes in the LCC housing department. But in Cambridge, the demand for low-rise, high-density housing for students uh, uh, developed this uh, Harvey, Harvey Court as a paradigm, uh, which became a paradigm for the development of uh, land use and built form studies to the point where, uh, if I don't have a slide of it today, but if you look at the plans that uh, Lionel March developed for the complete erasure of historic Whitehall around, uh, around the uh, area uh, of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of Westminster, uh, you have uh, the whole place is covered with Harvey Courts, uh, all imagined to be uh, bureaucratic offices. Uh, there you have the collegiate plan uh, developed as a typology by Leslie Martin uh, in AD. Uh, at the same time, uh, there was beginning in Cambridge, the interest of, uh, in architecture of, uh, of uh, computerization uh, under, under uh, Christopher Alexander, who uh, uh, passed away actually uh, two or three days ago, uh, but uh, who had uh, moved very seriously away from his early uh, interest in, uh, in uh, computerization and the way in which computerization could actually break down uh, the uh, forms of uh, functions uh, and develop a kind of hyper-functionalism uh, in architecture. How did this all play out in the studio? Well, the two figures in Cambridge who uh, pushed uh, history and theory into the design uh, practice, and I think uh, paradigmatically, uh, were Colin Rowe and a young PhD student who just uh, joined Cambridge in 1960, uh, Peter Eisenman. Uh, they became friends and they worked together, uh, but it was Colin Rowe that brought his extraordinary uh, uh, understanding of, uh, of the formal structures of, uh, of architecture, his almost uh, uh, a photographic memory of every single plan, every single facade, every single uh, building he had ever experienced into the studio. And I remember myself when I, I was sitting at my board in the second year and I had a, you, know, you had to have a huge uh, 
a, a huge round of, of, of paper, of tracing paper on, on, on the desk. And he came with this big fat black pencil and his hand was shaking because he had an injury in, in his back in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the Second World War. But he came to, the, to, came to your desk smelling of, 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 of cigar smoke and he leant over you and he said, no, 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 yes, yes, yes. And by the time he left, he had 20 or 30 different plans that you could have done if you had imagined them. And they were all somehow derived from Palladio or Michelangelo or some mannerist in the, in the reaches of, uh, of Tuscany somewhere, uh, maybe even a, a fascist architect in Italy uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, uh, in, in, in the center of Italy. So he, 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 he left you with this possibility but never left you with a definitive answer. So he always left you uh, with the possibility of another uh, kind of uh, architecture that you could develop uh, for yourself. Um, and uh, uh, there he is uh, looking rather uh, bemused at all the possibilities that Palladio offered, uh, the diagrams that Vitkova, his teacher gave him, and then he could therefore apply them to Le Corbusier and all the other architects that he looked at. And he would take those, uh, those, uh, those plans and develop them in a very much of a, of a Beaux-Arts way into the possible parties uh, of compositional architecture. And then there was uh, his student and my friend, Peter Eisenman. Uh, and here, Peter Eisenman was developing over the three years his PhD thesis, the idea of form uh, in modern architecture where he took uh, the, uh, the work of Frank Lloyd Wright, of Mies van der Rohe, of Alpha, Alto, and Le Corbusier, and sliced and diced them in such a way uh, that you began to understand them as, as a completely, uh, if you like, uh, operable matrices uh, for the development of, of a three-dimensional architecture. And of course, that later developed into the way in which he developed his own house projects uh, in the uh, 70s and 80s. In 1965, I graduated from Cambridge and thankfully fled to the United States. And uh, in the United States, I found sanctuary in Princeton. And in Princeton, uh, it was uh, just established as a school of architecture under a new dean, uh, Robert Geddes. Uh, and uh, Robert Geddes uh, brought to Princeton uh, an entirely new uh, and young faculty uh, which included Kenneth Frampton, uh, myself, uh, Peter Eisenman, uh, Michael Graves, and, uh, and a whole host of, uh, of younger uh, uh, architects uh, who were either coming to America or already in America, including, for example, uh, Diana Agrest, who now uh, teaches at, uh, at uh, Cooper Union. And so with this faculty, uh, uh, he was able uh, to build on an extraordinary legacy. Princeton actually had a PhD program. It was a PhD program that had been founded uh, in the late 1920s by uh, this, uh, this genial French uh, uh, graduate of the Ecole de Beaux-Arts uh, who uh, had uh, left France uh, very early in order to uh, work in, in Cuba and then left uh, having designed the uh, parts of the waterfront of Havana uh, for Princeton uh, in 1929, uh, uh, invited Le Corbusier to come to Princeton and set up his own uh, PhD and uh, research program uh, in uh, Princeton between 1929 and uh, the 1950s and 60s. He was still there as teaching the master's program when I came in 1965. Um, he had, uh, uh, sorry, he had uh, 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 developed himself very early uh, as a student of the Beaux-Arts. This is his uh, photograph of him actually uh, developing his uh, Prix de Rome project in his, uh, his studio in Paris before he left Paris. But then when he came to Princeton, he was much more interested uh, in research into architecture. He built a whole research uh, uh, arm uh, for the School of Architecture uh, to study light conditions, to study, uh, to study uh, environmental conditions. Uh, and worked with uh, the Hungarian Victor Olgai, who came uh, and uh, worked on climate design for very early in the 60s 
uh, publishing uh, this uh, design with climate, uh, which is in the present, uh, presently has been republished uh, because of the interest we have uh, in the relationship between regionalism and climate today. So that, uh, and he also uh, actually uh, taught a number of, uh, of, of students who became uh, quite famous in terms of the history of architecture. Uh, uh, here we have Charles Moore's PhD thesis on the relationship of water uh, to uh, modern architecture. Uh, Charles Moore took both uh, the Mies van der Rohe um, uh, 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 building uh, and the uh, Lieber House uh, opposite to uh, construct a whole series of interventions uh, with water. Um, and uh, of course, we actually now know uh, that, uh, uh, that, uh, uh, that, uh, that, how do I go back? Uh, we now know, of course, that uh, Robert uh, uh, and uh, Louise uh, Scott Brown uh, were uh, deeply involved in uh, the way in which uh, Labatou taught uh, history here. Uh, then um, uh, there's the uh, Dean uh, Geddes on the left. Uh, the individual sitting next to uh, Dean Geddes, uh, I think when I write my autobiography, it'll be called When We Had Hair. <laughs> um, and, and, and some uh, students who later became, uh, 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 one of them became a, a, a Dean at, uh, at Syracuse uh, on, on the right, sitting, uh, talking about architecture uh, in various ways. Uh, in, uh, uh, in the grounds of, of Princeton. Sorry. What uh, uh, Geddes wanted uh, was to develop uh, an entirely uh, uh, reconstructed uh, doctoral program uh, for architects as opposed to art historians. Uh, to be entered into the doctoral program, you had to be trained as an architect or an urbanist. Uh, you could not come with a simple undergraduate degree in art history. So what, uh, what Geddes asked Frampton, uh, myself, and a number of other uh, faculty members at Princeton to do was to construct uh, a program uh, in architectural research, a PhD program, uh, that would uh, build on the competences of Princeton University uh, the School of Architecture was deeply embedded in the university itself. It wasn't like Harvard or MIT, a separate school of architecture from the university. It was one faculty, and therefore we had anthropologists, sociologists, historians, literature critics, and, uh, and, uh, and others all uh, interested in, uh, in participating uh, in this PhD. And what happened was that uh, uh, we established the PhD program uh, as a new program, uh, between 71 and 1971 and 1972. It had three major areas of concentration, history and theory, uh, uh, social studies and uh, technological studies. Uh, each of them was headed by a um, uh, historian critic, uh, a sociologist and or, a, uh, uh, and or a, an engineer. Uh, we were all uh, one committee. And, and students had to take a major and a minor in each of those fields. So there was a kind of interdisciplinary relationship in the field itself. But fundamentally, what, uh, uh, what if you like, guided the program from behind uh, was uh, this gentleman on the left and his uh, publications. In reconstructing this program between 1966 and 1972, Geddes, Frampton, and myself were conscious of a fundamental turn in the nature of architectural history, one largely stimulated by the radical critique of Manfredo Tafuri in Italy, a historian who immersed in the post-war debates in Italy uh, over the complicity of modernism with fascism, over the perceived demand for a new contextualism with respect to the building of traditional communities, and over the long drawn out crisis of architectural education between the 60s and 68, Tafuri understood the history of architecture in a longer time span. Manfredo Tafuri, who had followed the 1964 debates in Cranbrook and elsewhere with interest, suggested the real problem didn't lie with the modernists and their postmodernist historicists, but with the gullible historians themselves 
who've been led to believe in the modernist claims of historical rejection or their own claims of uh, stylistic uh, perfection. A historian of the Renaissance, he recognized the extraordinary manipulations, indeed inventions of history demanded by the first revivalists of the, uh, of the 15th century. Uh, and uh, the first tentative stylistic quotations by Brunelleschi, the subsequent attempt by Alberti to construe a structural methodological framing for a new language. Uh, and he traced the gullibility of the historians to their over-identification with their objects of study. In the often misread and indeed very badly translated histories and theories of history of architecture published in 68, Tafuri did draw a boundary line for the historian precisely between history and what he called operative criticism. We'll talk about this a little later with some unfortunate results as I will turn to. But he also accomplished in this long and complex work was to open for the historian of architecture what was beginning to permeate the disciplines of history and the social sciences in general, the wave of theoretical investigations, roughly termed structuralist and post-structuralist. This is a, a quotation from Theories and History of 1960, uh, 1968. Every new architectural work is born in relation, no matter what, whether of continuity or antithesis to a symbolic content created by receding works freely chosen by the architect as terms of reference for his theme. Nor has the distance or proximity of these terms from the present any importance. Every architecture has its own critical nucleus. The language of architecture is formed, deformed, and left behind in history together with the very idea of architecture. In this sense, the establishment of a general grammar of architecture is utopia. Strictly speaking, between the Roman triumphal arch and the project for urban renewal, the gap is so great as to make one doubt the functionality of a history that would embrace both in the same series. The task of history is the recovery of the original functions and ideologies that in the course of time define and delimit the role and meaning of architecture. It's not from the historical context that the present tasks are born. It's not up to the historian to take on the job of sanctifying the historical continuity of the discipline. Now, if you then apply that, and this is what I will uh, end with to, today, I'm not gonna end right now, but I will end with the notion of applying uh, uh, Tafuri's uh, distinction between the history of architecture and the present activity of architecture. But if you apply the, the criteria by which he looks at the history of architecture to the present condition of architecture, then you have a theoretical and critical nexus for the development, I think, of new research, uh, developing uh, all the kinds of questions that open up uh, for us or opened up for us in the 60s, uh, not a Piranesi as a kind of, uh, as a kind of relic of the, of the 18th century, but an active participant uh, in the active culture of the, of, the, uh, of, the, of, the, of the 20th century as Piranesi's carchery uh, were, were taken as, uh, as uh, as, uh, as uh, forms and functions for Eisenstein's films, uh, the analysis of, of Utopia, uh, the analysis of Borromini, the analysis of the stages and, 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 and reformulations uh, of uh, Piranesi's etchings and the way uh, in which here uh, on the right, uh, Tafuri republishing Eisenstein's uh, filmic analyses uh, of Piranesi uh, suddenly gave us a sense that despite uh, Tafuri's understanding of the separation of history uh, from the present, uh, what we actually have is if you understand history right, you'll understand the, the nature of history's adoption, appreciation, recombination, and reformulation right too. Uh, and his work on the sphere in the labyrinth, the re Renaissance, uh, research in the Renaissance, and Venezia, uh, Venice and the Renaissance, each of these uh, books uh, has an introduction. And each of those introductions is extremely important in tracing uh, Tafuri's own uh, theoretical trajectory. And his theoretical trajectory actually encompassed uh, the whole system of uh, thought that in the 60s and 70s, uh, we were uh, trying to assimilate uh, as they were being translated and developed 
uh, in Paris and elsewhere, in Paris and Italy uh, in the 60s, uh, structuralism and post-structuralism. So that our first uh, PhD program uh, was concentrated on the study, not just of architecture, but also on how the different disciplines of the social sciences uh, could actually contribute to our analysis of the forms, the functions, the, the structures, the organizations, the social relations, uh, the economies, uh, and, the, and the meaning uh, of architecture as its own kind of object. So we looked at Saussure, uh, we looked at uh, Levi-Strauss, uh, we looked at the way in which Levi-Strauss had organized and understood uh, the different social, ritual, uh, and, uh, uh, and artistic functions of uh, the different uh, societies that uh, he analyzed. Uh, we looked at the way in which uh, a new interpreter of Freud, Jacques Lacan, was being, uh, was, 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 uh, was analyzing Freud uh, in terms of the 1940s and 50s and understanding after the uh, Second World War, the nature of trauma, the nature of paranoia, and the nature of schizophrenia in the, in the uh, mirror stage. We looked at someone who was interested in the text behind the text, the, the myths that inform text, the structure of texts themselves, uh, looking at, uh, for example, that wonderful essay on the mythology of the, uh, the deus, the uh, Citroën uh, uh, car that became such a, a model of French production immediately after the war. And of course, but Roland Barthes, uh, because the, uh, because the uh, car was named uh, DS, Citroën DS, uh, in French, it's deus, it's a goddess. Uh, and therefore uh, had a kind of mythical uh, pronouncement there, of course, de Gaulle uh, in, his de in his goddess uh, going uh, down the street. And I think before, uh, before 1968. Uh, and uh, analyzing the works of, uh, of, various, uh, of various writers who had attempted to make new kinds of languages. Uh, Fourier trying to make new languages in space and, uh, and words uh, for new societies or Dessard trying to understand uh, the play of power uh, and sexuality with the languages uh, of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of ritual. Or Derrida, understanding the internal structures of texts, uh, those things that weren't said on the surface of the texts themselves in order to, 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 to go beneath and to reconstrue uh, the ambiguous and sometimes uh, uh, quite uh, uh, unarticulated uh, relations of philosophy to, to, to meaning. Uh, to Foucault, uh, of course, uh, for myself, Foucault was one of the uh, messengers of how to understand architecture in a much more uh, global uh, context, uh, where he began to understand institutions, not simply as architectural depositories, but as architectural depositories of a whole uh, nature of discourses, discourses around uh, madness, discourses around clinical, discourses around words. Uh, there, Foucault, uh, as an activist, uh, working uh, with Sartre uh, to reform uh, those terrible conditions of prisons in Paris in the 1960s that uh, interned so many hundreds and thousands of uh, Algerian subjects uh, who were fighting a war of uh, independence. Uh, and uh, the whole question of, uh, of power and the observation of power and the organization of power in 19th and 20th century societies uh, developing, of course, with Foucault into the internal power uh, that we, uh, we self-regulate uh, the power uh, within our, ourselves. Uh, and uh, here I am teaching in Princeton, uh, uh, on the right, uh, Bentham, on the left, Ledoux. Uh, and you can see I had the right message and I gave the right message to my students. This 1972, when we did have hair. Uh, and students out of this uh, extraordinary uh, program, very uh, powerful series of students. Uh, I can, I give you just two, my first two PhD students in Princeton, Richard Etlin, who went to Paris and studied the whole uh, topology uh, an etiology of the notion of death in the Enlightenment uh, and the development of the cemeteries and the development of the purification of cemeteries and the development of monumental architecture, then going to uh, Italy and studying fascist architecture and then developing the whole symbolic role of architecture and space. 
Uh, or uh, Mary McLeod, was my second PhD student who uh, majored as an undergraduate at Princeton in politics and political science, uh, and then went on to uh, do the first major inquiry of the relationships of, uh, of Le Corbusier uh, to colonialization, to, uh, to the fascist government and to Algiers, and then on to do pioneering work with Charles Perriand and others uh, and uh, forcing through uh, the notion as a, as a major voice still teaching at Columbia uh, in, the, in the relationship of gender feminist uh, architecture. And so, very quickly, uh, how did I respond to all this uh, as my, my own, if, if you like, a student of my own teaching? Well, I was brought up during the war. You can see uh, the young architecture student on the left. Um, and uh, you can see what I saw in London uh, on the top right, and what I saw as the mythicization of a new and reconstructed Britain on the uh, bottom right, the Festival of Britain. Uh, these are the conditions that I saw uh, at, as a five-year-old being shown uh, the ruins of London, uh, as a 10-year-old being taken to the Festival of Britain, and not being quite sure that the one and the other were connected in a very, very uh, fundamental way. And so uh, when uh, uh, interrogating the notion of uh, utopia uh, and interrogating it with the, with the critical uh, vision of my tutor at Cambridge, Colin Rowe, uh, I began to look into the notion of architecture and utopia and its ambiguous relations to do with the future and its ambiguous relationships with power, its amb ambiguous relationships, of course, with industry, with colonialism, and so on. Uh, and I was drawn to, uh, you know, this is the trauma of uh, graduating from Cambridge. And those are three of uh, the most uh, important, uh, if you like, historical mentors uh, both uh, friends uh, and, uh, uh, and, uh, uh, and tutors, if you like, uh, Kenneth Frampton on the left, Carl Shorsky, uh, one of the great histori cultural historians of, uh, of uh, Princeton, with whom I taught courses and established programs uh, for many, many years, and, uh, and of course, uh, the inevitable Peter Eisenman. So here we have my first forays into the archive. Uh, un, un, really unsatisfied with the ways in which art history, of which Emil Kaufman and all the art historians had looked at visionary architecture. I went uh, in 1967 to the Assault Works that uh, Ledoux had built uh, near uh, in, in France Fronte in the south, uh, southeast of France and found it to be the ruin of a factory. Visionary architecture, maybe but it was the ruins of a factory. And so I began to uh, research the, uh, and found in various small towns uh, around uh, the uh, salt works and in Paris in various archives, uh, the uh, actual working drawings and the constructional drawings uh, of the uh, salt works. I found the registers of the workings of the salt works, how many old men had fallen into the boiling water, how many people had died, how many people had been wounded, how many people had uh, tried to steal the salt, how many people had been uh, let go, uh, how many people had uh, brought their wives into the, uh, illegally into the salt works and so on. So I had the whole working history of the salt works from uh, 19, uh, 1774 uh, through, to, uh, through to its closure uh, in the early 1900s. And I also was able to begin to construct the sources of the architect's imagination, Ledoux here, uh, developing a uh, little uh, factory shed uh, for the charcoal burner. And where did he get the form from? He got the form from the charcoal burner's own, uh, own practices uh, as uh, developed, uh, as we see recorded in, uh, in, uh, in uh, Diderot's uh, encyclopedia. Uh, and here, how did he, uh, why did he imagine a house for the people who make barrels in the form of a barrel? Well, he made it uh, precisely in the form of the practice of barrel makers. And of course the barrels are those, those containers uh, like uh, shipping containers that take the salt 
out of the salt works. So that kind of research impelled by my own uh, uh, training in history in England with uh, Eric Hobsbawm and, uh, and uh, Raymond Williams and other social historians uh, was particularly important for me to understand the relations of architecture to production, the relations of architecture uh, to industry. And uh, with the students constructing uh, the nature of the production process uh, in the salt works itself. Uh, and then, of course, the publication of the Big Ledoux and then the Baby Ledoux, uh, which came out in a uh, review, revised uh, version, actually, uh, just a few months ago. Uh, but I found the, uh, the, uh, the map of the, of the, uh, of the, uh, of the great forest uh, in which the salt works was set so that they could use the wood of the forest. And you see that on the bottom right. And you can see here the, the foundation drawings that I found of the, of the, of the semicircle itself. Uh, and there we have it uh, as, a, as, a, as a built object. But then uh, the result of that research was that I was given this building uh, as an architect to, uh, to restore uh, as a building and then inside uh, to construct this, uh, there, there's a plan of the building. It was actually the, the building in which the barrels were made. And those are the water, the water tanks in which the wood was soaked. So you could bend it around and make a barrel out of it. Uh, this is the building as it was when I inherited it. Uh, and this is the building that I planned, a, a, uh, uh, a museum uh, that I invented of uh, models of all the do's ideal and uh, built projects. Uh, in the center, a little theater to, uh, for, the, for the visitors to look at uh, videos and movies of uh, the work. And then chronologically from uh, here, we have from right to left, a complete trajectory, uh, chronological trajectory of, uh, of uh, models of the do's projects. Uh, you can see them there. You can see the theater on the left. We built it out of uh, local oak uh, with local joiners. Uh, and uh, we uh, remade the, uh, the timbers, cleaned the timbers of the, of the roof and constructed uh, a, a really a forest uh, of, uh, of models uh, in, that, uh, in that it's still going. They keep it uh, beautifully and uh, maintain it magnificently. And then came, of course, my, the, 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 my the sort of induction into, into the French uh, uh, Soisantuitat, the, 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 the 68ers. Uh, I was in France in 1967 and then in 1969, but I missed 1968, fortunately or unfortunately, because I had a teaching, uh, teaching gig at Princeton. But my friends, uh, Bruno Fortier and Antoine Grumbach, were, the, were very powerful in that uh, 68 movement. And they were uh, deeply influenced and very close to. And Fortier, in fact, uh, wrote uh, two books with Foucault, uh, understanding the implications of Foucault uh, for the uh, new uh, institutions of the 18th, 19th, and 20th century, which sent me into the archive of, uh, of Fourier and the Utopian Socialists. I found, I was the first to find that uh, Fourier actually uh, was uh, deeply involved in drawing uh, his, uh, his projects. There's a whole folio in his archives buried deep uh, of, his, uh, of his drawings. Uh, and uh, uh, we analyzed the ways in which he had uh, struggled uh, to uh, develop a plan for uh, his uh, community, which he called a phalanster or phalanstery. All this was published in, uh, in this book, The Writing of the Walls, that, uh, that Marta no noted. Uh, the French edition is much better. I revised the French edition and uh, uh, introduced new material, uh, L'Espace de Lumière, uh, but it details the whole myths, uh, all the myths of the origin of architecture in the Enlightenment. Uh, it introduces Fourier and Le Coeur and others, uh, together with a whole series of uh, essays on the institutions uh, of the Enlightenment, uh, written all in a very uh, post-Foucault tone. Uh, at the same time, I was involved, uh, as, uh, as was said at the very beginning, in the Institute, uh, which brought together architects, historians, critics, theorists, and, uh, and the populist of New York, 
uh, we ran all kinds of public programs, uh, evening programs, and, uh, and day programs, and student programs. So it's a, it was itself a kind of interdisciplinary uh, society, as you can see it uh, once, uh, once a week uh, with beer and, uh, and curry uh, around the table. And uh, that introduced me then uh, to the whole question of urbanism as a research project on streets. Uh, I developed a whole uh, theory and uh, analysis and criticism of the history of urban streets uh, in the 19th century all the way through uh, to the 20th century use of the streets by the situationists. I then got very interested uh, in, term, in, in, in psychoanalysis and, uh, and, uh, and uh, psychology and the history of psychoanalysis and psychology as it had inflected uh, the way in which architectural space and architectural theory had, uh, had been developed. Uh, here, Freud uh, diagramming the architecture of the unconscious uh, and uh, my first work on the questions of uh, the unheimlich or the unhomely uh, in, uh, in uh, 19th and 20th century architecture, Victor Hugo on the left, uh, and uh, the moving there into uh, questions that were opened by Lacan and Deleuze into uh, the whole relationship of philosophy and psychology. Uh, Deleuze, of course, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the, no the notion of a Leibnizian space, uh, which had not been explored by philosophy and Lacan, a Freudian space uh, that needed to be explored in relationship to the ego. And that space myself, uh, I explored in relationship to phobia, agoraphobia, and other kinds of, uh, of, of psychological uh, conditions uh, in uh, warp space. I was then asked to enter the, an archive which was not an ancient archive like Ledoux or an ancient archive like Fourier, but a very contemporary archive. In fact, it was so contemporary that the archive came from an architect that was deceased only two or three years before. Uh, it was uh, the archive of the office of uh, of uh, James Sterling and Michael Wilford. Uh, it uh, contained the uh, drawings uh, and projects of uh, James Sterling from the beginning of his career with James Down all through uh, to his untimely death. Uh, I was asked by the CCA to develop a large exhibition of the work uh, as they received this archive. Particularly difficult for me uh, Sterling had been my 40th critic at Cambridge and had become, uh, as we both uh, taught in the States, a, a very close uh, uh, friend and, and, and companion. Uh, and uh, his untimely decease had left me both uh, shocked and, uh, and uh, particularly dismayed. But nevertheless, I plunged into the archive, which is, was very troubling at first. It's like going through, uh, you know, a family member's, uh, you know, letters. You don't know what you're going to find or how you're going to find it. Uh, but it was uh, increasingly interesting as I began to find things that I never knew uh, and that nobody else had really known uh, about uh, Jim Sterling. And so I spent five or six years going through 44,000 pieces of paper, uh, both uh, in terms of uh, writings and in terms of the models and in terms of, uh, of uh, archives, uh, and uh, produced a book, uh, which I called Notes from the Archive, mainly because I wasn't prepared to write a monograph on having studied the archive as a whole uh, for five years. I was more prepared to say, well, here we are, this is my impression. Here we have a number of, 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 of projects uh, that seem to uh, activate our understanding of how Sterling worked and what he was about. Uh, and uh, let's leave it to future historians and future monograph writers to actually uh, develop and complete uh, uh, the idea. So this, is really, this was really a, uh, a provisional uh, understanding of uh, the archive. This is the archive as it was stored in the frigidly cold uh, conditions of the, uh, of the CCA basement. 
uh, if you work in an archive, you, you have to have, of course, your, your gloves on and you have to have, actually you have to have all your coat on, coats on because it's so cold in that archive to preserve not humans, but paper. Uh, and then uh, you're told that the big cylinders at the end of each of these rooms, uh, if, you were, you, if by chance your camera's flash went off, that they would suddenly fill the room with gas, preserving the paper, but not you. So uh, you were very careful to turn your flash off, um, the, the model rooms and the, and the paper rooms. Uh, and I found all kinds of stuff. I found these notebooks uh, as a student uh, at, uh, in school uh, in Liverpool as a bird watcher. Now, see, I, actually, that gave me a theory. It gave me a theory of the difference between, because in England, uh, when I was growing up, there were two kinds of uh, things you did. Uh, when you were sent out of the house when you know your mother wanted to clean the house and you had to get out of the house you were either a bird watcher or a train spotter um and now i had a theory having seen that uh, that sterling was a bird watcher i have a theory uh about bird watchers and train spotters i have a theory that if sterling was a bird watcher norman foster was a train spotter uh, we, I really believe that. And I asked Norman that, and he said, of course. I uh, found his uh, thesis. Uh, actually, um, I, his thesis was not only a book with all the photographs of the various models, plus the final model he developed, plus sheet after sheet of working drawings of one of the buildings of in this uh, city center that he was developing, plus a series of 10 beautiful perspective and sectional and uh, uh, actinometric drawings of this single building. I, I occasionally show that to my students at Cooper and wonder whether or not they are going to actually produce a thesis of that kind of completion uh, and they kind of back off. Uh, that was the uh, that was the the first uh, iteration of the exhibition at uh, Yale. What was very difficult uh, was installing uh, my Sterling show in a Lucan building. Uh, the Lucan building was a rigorous uh, set of square bays. You weren't allowed to cross any of the bays with any of your stuff. You could not take off the beige uh, cloth that covered the, the walls. Um, and it was particularly problematic because the, uh, the, the British Art Center had been a limited competition to which both Sterling and Lucan had contributed. And uh, whenever I went up to, to Yale to be on uh, Sterling's juries, um, he always conspicuously avoided the Khan building. And when I said, um, well, so have you never been in there? He said, why would I? And so I said, come on, Jim, come on, get over it. You know, you didn't win, but it's not a bad building. Let's go in. So we went in and he wandered through and he said, uh, 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 uh. and he came across the circular stair and he, he put his arms like that and he said, well, this could be a piece of architecture. And we found the one model that he made himself in New York when he was uh, on uh, the scholarship that they gave at Liverpool for one semester away in New York. He was working in New York with a, with a firm of architects. He still had to present a project. He presented this project based on his, uh, his study of uh, Breuer and uh, young Rudolf in, in, uh, in, in Florida of an architect's house. Uh, which he then built as a model and put in a box and sent back to Liverpool. And on the basis of all this, uh, I put together a, a series of uh, remembrances of analyses of four architectural, uh, uh, four architectural historians who had uh, most influenced me in my career. The first uh, historian of Ledoux Kaufman, uh, the second historian to touch me, my, uh, my, uh, my uh, tutor at Cambridge, Colin Rowe. Uh, the third, uh, my escape to London, Raina Bannum. And the fourth, uh, my, uh, my friend 
uh, and, uh, and instructor uh, Manfredo Tafuri. And that became the basis of my PhD. Uh, in 2005, finally, I attained the level of having a doctorate. <laughs> I hope it doesn't take you as long. <laughs> But I still look to the future. Thank you. After this, I hope that um, if you have some questions, um, that uh, if Anthony still wants to answer. <laughs> I, you know, I have very few answers, but I would love to hear your questions because they would then become my questions for the future. <laughs> Hello, I was not expecting to make the first question, <laughs> but since nobody starts, I would like to ask, it's going to be a very selfish question, so apologize for that. First of all, thank you so much. I never saw a lecture in such a short time explaining the theory of architecture in such a way that you did. So my humble thank you, because this was, you make my day, you make my year. Thank you for this. <laughs> So my selfish question is about this. Knowing all this, and I think your lecture for a few of us, we could try to follow you. And I think this idea of the PhD for a lot of other generation of students will be great. But I was on the back and I was looking at all these young faces and those are the ones I'm teaching. And those are the ones I'm worried because in fact, uh, we just had accreditation in our school in Canada and everybody said, forget digital, you have to teach the students theory. <laughs> and so my humble question for you is, looking at this audience that you have here, what would be the essential, the basic things that we as teachers should start with to help them to understand, to help them to really engage in theory because we understand how important it is. But how can we pass this to them? And which are the ones that we should really focus in order for them to get the seed to later on to progress? So I'm sorry, it's very selfish, but I need your help. Thank you. Well, I'm not sure I can, I can help you in particular, but what I can do is to say that there are a number of, um, number of principles that I've always followed. Uh, I have had every school I've been in, starting with Princeton, I've had to be the one to write the report to the accreditors, right? To, to in a sense, write the cover letter that uh, translates the strange things we do in the school to the orthodoxes that the accreditors come with, right? Um, and so I, I, the first thing to do is not to confuse what the profession wants with what you are teaching. Uh, the second thing to do is not to confuse theory with thinking about architecture at a fundamental level in relationship to what architecture has to do at various moments at different scales, what it ought to do at various moments and various scales and how it might do that. And so I think that if you, if one concentrates on the principles uh, that one has sort of internally uh, around uh, questions of, uh, I don't think, for example, I had this big argument, this is a, a little sidetrack, I'm sorry, but I, I had this big argument with Peter Eisenman, right? Um, and it was right uh, where, we had a, where we had a kind of symposium around the Sterling exhibit. He kind of liked the Sterling exhibit, like I was very happy he liked it, right? But he said, you know, Sterling was not a theorist, right? Uh, Peter Smithson was a theorist, right? Which meant that for, for Eisenman, only people who wrote were theorists. I said, but haven't you seen the drawings of Sterling? He said, yeah. I said, they are absolutely theoretical. Every iteration of every, of every plan as he developed it in axonometric and, and, and section 
is a thinking moment of transforming one idea about architecture into the next idea about architecture. That's a, that's a, that's a theoretical act, right? So drawing for me is theoretical, modeling for me is theoretical, uh, imaging from, you know, imaging in my head is theoretical, constructing a, uh, you know, a three-dimensional uh, uh, diagram on the computer is theoretical. Uh, all of them are, if they are not, and they have to be thought of as theoretical, otherwise they get stuck and they become images. Uh, they become, you know, uh, fixed kinds of uh, what I call Photoshop architecture, that kind of stuff. So I, I just think that if you, if one can if one concentrates on uh, the principles that you can develop from oneself and from the ethical and economic constructions of society in terms of what architecture does, that's what you teach. Uh, and it, and I actually teach. And I hate the idea, actually. I, I guess what I'm trying to say is that it's a learning. My, my work has always been, I started very young as, as a teacher. I was scared, absolutely shitless, right? I just didn't know what I could do and say. And I suddenly realized, just because I happened to be a little older uh, than these returned veterans from Vietnam, right, who sort of wanted to go play darts with me and, uh, and beat me up and all that kind of stuff. And, and, and the only thing they didn't beat me up because I was a professor, right? So I just, just, I just decided I was learning with them, right? And there's what wasn't us and them. It was me and, and them as, 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 a, as a group. And I've always found the notion of, of establishing the group of, of, of students that one is working with as a research group and, and, and giving them agency to ask the questions that will then demand answers from oneself. Uh, that's, that's the way. I mean, I, you know, I, don't, I don't drop the knowledge I have, right? But at the same time, there's a lot of uh, internal and uh, uh, straightforward social, economic, aesthetic, and, and, and uh, public and private wisdom that comes from each one of us. And so listening is just as important, I think, as speaking. So I, I did a lot of lecturing just now, but actually what I'm you know, much more interested in uh, when I meet with the PhD students uh, this afternoon is hearing, is listening and finding out uh, where they're coming from and why they're there and and responding to that. So I, I don't think you have to be frightened. I can make a last question. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> well, because you started with a small comment on uh, that, uh, on uh, the, the words of Octavio Path, and you said just something like that, uh, you also would like to change the world. So yeah. I would like to ask you if you could make a small reflection on how can research change architecture, in fact? Sometimes research changes an actual portion, element, approach, a way of thinking about some kind of scale of architecture, right? So, um, but I don't think research changes architecture. I think that uh, research in, in architecture is actually something that uh, is a way of, of developing architecture. I, I, don't see, I don't see a disjunction between research and architecture. I mean, I think if I'm, you know, when I, when I first uh, had, the, when, when, when I was working uh, in, uh, in Cooper Union over a week or so with Shigeru Ban, right? Shigeru Ban is a, is a, is a, actually was a graduate of Cooper. And uh, we were sitting together and he said, you know, I got this idea uh, around um, these paper cylinders that are used to, uh, for column, uh, column forms, right? And he said, um, you know, he said, I'm thinking of doing something with them. You know, and he then said, to, you know, well, you know about, he taught me, you know about primitive huts, and, you know, and you now like the enlightenment, what about a primitive hut? And I said, well, why don't you try a primitive hut? And now he is in uh, Poland, 
with lots of paper tubes, building very, 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 very uh, important shelters for uh, for uh, for refugees. Uh, refugees. And so I, 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 you know, that's research. You know, and I, I think you know you could do the same with aluminum windows, or you could do the same with um, with uh, the idea of uh, of an institution that doesn't have. Uh, uh, certain kinds of barriers in relationship to different spaces. I mean, I don't see, I mean, research is thinking about architecture. So research in the history of architecture gives you a sensitivity to certain aspects of, uh, of space, certain aspects of technology, certain aspects of, uh, of uh, traditional formulation, certain aspects of climate, uh, which might help in actually when you're thinking about uh, developing your own project. So, I, I don't see there's a there's the you know just as I don't think there's there's a big division between as an architect I don't feel there's a big division between the history of architecture and contemporary design I don't see there's a distinction between uh, research in architecture technology in architecture all those things they all have to be used to make architecture better. Many thanks. Good luck. <laughs>